The goal of this video is to derive Ohm's law from the microscopic point of view by looking at electrons. And this is not a standalone video. We have done a lot of work before this in previous videos. So we're just gonna uh, pick up from where we left off. So before we start, let's quickly you know, recap whatever stuff that we've already seen. We saw that Paul Druda, a German physicist, was the first person in around 1900s to st start giving an explanation, a model to explain this. And his idea was he treated electrons as tiny, tiny particles, tiny balls of matter. And he said that when you, you know, when you put a, when you put a battery, there's an electric field that accelerates the electrons, but the electrons don't travel in straight lines because there are a lot of uh, crystal ions, metal ions over here, these electrons are continuously bombarding, continuously bouncing off, sorry, continuously bouncing off these different, different ions. And so it has a very zigzaggy kind of motion. And so here's how we visualized it. We, electrons are moving with extremely high random velocities, thousands of kilometers per second, thermal motion we say, but that's not gonna get them anywhere because they keep bouncing back and forth. However, in the presence of an electric field, we do see that slowly and steadily, it starts moving across the conductor. And it's this motion that contributes to the electric current. And we call this the drifting motion. And we figured out what that drifting velocity was. And so coming back, so what we did is we said, look, we are no longer imagining that the electron, we can forget about this, we can forget about this, and instead we can imagine that all the electrons are moving with a constant velocity. And that's what we call the drift velocity. They're not doing that, but that's what contributes to electric current. So this is how we assumed, and we figured out what the drift velocity was. We found that that drift velocity is this number. And the way we calculate it is this is the acceleration, which is force acting on the elect electrons divided by mass. So this is the acceleration of the electrons multiplied by the time. And this time is the average time between two successive collisions. We call that relaxation time. And so the surprising thing over here was even though the electrons are continuously accelerated by the field, the net motion is constant velocity. It's, it doesn't change. We can assume that it's moving with a constant velocity. This is the most important part of this entire derivation. And then, we used this model to figure out what the electric current was in terms of drift velocity. And we figured out that the electric current equals this number. And again, to give you a little sense of what this number is saying, this N represents the number of electrons per unit volume. It's the number density of the electrons. And so this over here tells you how many electrons are passing per second. So this, if you think about it, is the volume uh, of the electrons per second, volume traveled per second, and this is the total electrons per second, and you multiply it by the charge to give you total charge. And again, this is derived previously, so you can go back and revise if it's necessary. Now, with these two, we have to figure out, or we have to derive or prove Ohm's law. All right, so where do we start? Well, since Ohm's law has current and voltage in it, and I see current, let's start from here. I know the expression for current, and I can substitute the expression for Vd over here. So if I do that, I'll get I equals E times N times A, where A is the cross-sectional area of this conductor, times Vd, and that Vd, I'm gonna substitute from here. So that's going to be E times capital E divided by M into tau. Tau is the relaxation time, all right. So we can go ahead and simplify that now. That'll give me, let me write this in here, then I get an E squared. Then I have my A, let me write, yeah, okay, then I have my A, I have my tau divided by M, sorry, same color, times the electric field. All right, so we have brought the current into the picture, but I need the voltage now. I want to bring the voltage into the picture. Voltage is basically the potential difference across this conductor. But what I have is the electric field inside the conductor. So I know that the battery creates an electric field from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. So here is that electric field in this direction. And that electric field I know. But can I calculate what the potential difference is from this electric field? Well. Yeah, there is a connection between the field and potential difference. 
Why don't you pause the video for a while and see if you can recollect that yourself. All right, the electric field is the negative potential gradient. Let me just write that down over here. Electric field is the negative potential gradient. And, you know, <laughs> in a lot of jargons over here, what this basically means, let me take an example, it'll make a lot of sense. So if I said the electric field was something like, you know, 10 units, in this case, units would be volt per meter. You can say you know, newtons per coulomb is the usual uh, unit, but you can also say volts per coulomb, or vol volts per meter. So if the electric field was 10 volts per meter, what this is saying is that if you travel along the electric field, every meter you're going down potential of 10 volt. Okay, electric potential 10 volt. So one meter you go forward, 10 volt you drop. Another meter you go forward, another 10 volt it drops. And the negative sign is basically saying that along the field, potential drops. Just like in gravity, as you go down along the field, the gravitational potential drops, it decreases. Same concept over here, okay? So that is the connection between electric field and the, and the potential difference. So in our case, we know the potential difference across the conductor. Let's, that itself is what V is. So that potential difference we know is V. And let's say the length of the conductor is L. The length of this conductor is L. And we're going to assume that this uh, electric field is pretty uniform. And if we do that, then we don't need the differential sign over here. We can just say electric field has to be the potential difference divided by length in magnitude. All I'm considering is in magnitude, okay? These are all magnitudes. I'm not considering signs over here. And so if I plug that in, I will now get, what is this? I'll get N E squared times A tau divided by M into E is V divided by L. So the potential difference has now come into the picture and notice we're almost done. We've gotten V is equal to IR form, right? We have I here and we have V over here. And indeed, current is proportional to voltage. So this itself is the proof of Ohm's law. And why is this happening? Why is current turning out to be proportional to voltage? It's coming out because of this expression. It's all coming from here because electrons are traveling with a constant speed, drifting with a constant speed, which is proportional to the strength of the electric field. Everything boils from there. That's why I said this is the most important part of the derivation. Now all we have to do is put this in a nice form over here. So let me shift all of this on this side. So it's just gonna become the reciprocal. And if we do that, this is what we end up with. You can just check, I just rearranged it. So we have now the familiar form, and so whatever is in the bracket, notice that's all a constant. It does not depend on voltage or current. This is the mass of the electrons, charge on the electron, relaxation time, which is dependent on the temperature and the material, something we'll speak about in the future videos. N is the number density, again, independent of these two, and L length and the area are the dimensions of the conductor. So notice this whole thing is a constant, and that's basically what we are gonna call our resistance. Resistance. And so we have derived Ohm's law. And so of course, we'll talk about uh, this expression in another video separately. I don't wanna rush it in this video. But one thing you can see, you can get some insights now, where is this resistance coming from? The resistance comes from the collisions of the electrons with the different, different atoms. And you can see it from this formula. You see there's a tau in the denominator. Tau is the relaxation time, right? It's the time, average time between successive collisions. Now imagine if there were no collisions at all then tau would be infinity, right? If there are no collisions at all, then the time for the next collision would be infinity. So if there were no collisions, tau would be infinity, and if denominator was infinity, this resistance would have been zero. So you can now get this amazing thing, right? We at the microscopic level, we are able to understand what causes resistance. It's the collisions between the electrons and the atoms. And so I guess to close the video, I'd just like to say one mind boggling thing for me is we are used, you're using Newtonian mechanics, treating electrons as tiny particles, which you might know by now is not accurate. For microscopic particles, you are supposed to use quantum mechanics. But even then, with these models and assumptions, we are still able to get such a nice insight into what's really happening inside the conductor and we are able to derive Ohm's law. And that's, that's pretty amazing.